Hello and welcome to episode 123 of the Monday Night Review. Do you remember who I am and what I sound like? There has been a bit of a gap. I went to the Christmas markets in Berlin. It was lovely. I had a lovely time. I just went Sunday to Tuesday with my friend Sarah. It was great. We drank hot chocolate. We looked at Christmas lights. I uh, got some nice things from the Christmas market. Sarah got a lot of Christmas decorations. I also got flu. So I got home on Tuesday night at about midnight and by 11.30 on Wednesday was in bed and it just got worse and worse and worse. And I couldn't move. And then I got a kidney infection. So thank goodness I was given antibiotics by the doctor on the 22nd, I believe. Maybe a little later, the 23rd, the Friday before Christmas, I finally got some antibiotics and was able to rise from my bed. But it was absolutely, I cannot remember being that ill. Everything got dropped. And I think I'm one of those people that does a lot of different things. Obviously, I've got kids. I do this podcast. I've got a couple of different jobs. I have Christmas stuff to do. I have house stuff to do. I have dogs to walk and I ride a friend's horse. And it was just like lying in bed, unable to move, watching every plate you have spinning just drop to the floor and there's nothing you can do about it. It was pretty horrendous. But the antibiotics kicked in. I hadn't eaten for about two weeks and my first proper meal with an appetite was Christmas lunch. I was up. I felt well. It was just as for the whole thing. I was thinking as long as I'm well enough to get out of bed to spend some time at Christmas with my kids, it does, you know, this doesn't matter. It's got to get better. And it did. So I am still riding on the high of that. And I'm sorry for the radio silence. I do like to, I have a, a, um, I'm a makeup artist and I have a beauty group on Facebook. And since it started a long time ago, I try and pop on and do lives and stuff during the Christmas break, because I know that some people find it really difficult. Some people find it very lonely. Some people find, um, Spending time with other people too much can make you make you need a bit of alone time, and it's quite nice to have something to go and watch, or listen to on your own. Maybe put a podcast in whilst you're washing up, and just have a bit of time to yourself. And so I do really. I'm a. I'm just really aware that I like to create content for people to have. So I feel like I've let you let you all down. But it's New Year's Day when you're hearing this. And happy new year. I'm looking forward to spending 2024 with you. And thanks for all your support so far during the the lifespan of this podcast. So today we are talking about illnesses. I'd like to brief you just in case anyone has something they can't um, deal with. For example, I'm a metaphobic. So if anyone on a podcast that I'm listening to starts talking about sick bugs, I re- it makes me go, oh, no, 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 stop. We're talking about not sick bugs, but we're talking about um, typhoid fever today. So brace yourselves. There's nothing too gross, I have to say. Well, let's ease into the year gently. Typhoid fever, also known as typhoid, is a disease called by the salmonella serotype typhi bacteria. Typhus is a different disease, which I sort of, I guess I knew, but I didn't definitely know. So typhus is a different disease. Typhus, I think, encapsulates uh, a lot of bacteria that do the same thing. Owing to their similar symptoms, they're not recognised as distinct diseases until the 1800s. Typhoid means resembling typhus. So that's why they they sound similar is that they are very similar but whereas typhus was a catch-all for for diseases that had these symptoms the typhoid bacteria was identified as something completely separate the so-called plague of athens in 430 bc was most likely typhoid fever and the fact that bacteria was linked to unclean water supply eventually led to the chlorination of water from 1905 in the uk so it had a big effect and quite a lot of famous plagues or epidemics were in fact typhoid fever because it is, you know, it happens in unclean water. So it can pop up wherever. 
The symptoms include sudden prolonged high temperature, headaches, nausea, loss of appetite, followed by a bad cough, hoarseness, diarrhea or constipation, skin rashes and inflammation. And even as late as the 1940s, until antibiotics arrived, there was not a lot that a doctor could do for a patient with typhoid fever. 10% of those who got ill would die from it. And it was horrible. Throughout the history... Throughout history, typhoid fever has been referred to by various names, often associated with the symptoms. I do find this quite interesting when you're reading history books and they'll say something like fever of the brain and you think, what is that encephalitis? Is that something else? So the names associated with typhoid fever are gastric fever, enteric fever, abdominal typhus, infantile remittent fever, slow fever, nervous fever. Pythogenic fever, drain fever, and low fever. So if you're reading history book or historical fiction, you see these mentions. Now you know what it is. It's typhoid fever. In the 1880s to early 1900s, it was associated with unclean living conditions, which is f- fair. It is in unsanitary water. So it was considered a disease of the poor. And da 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 immigrants so it had a lot of connotations around it in 1880 Carl Erbrith isolated the organism identified with typhoid fever specifically and so then they were able to test for it they could find if they could find this bacteria in the water they knew that that water was contaminated it's rife in army camps where access to clean water and good sanitation was difficult during the boer war of 1899 to 1902 13,000 british soldiers died of typhoid fever compared to 8,000 who died on the battlefield just gives you an idea of how awful this disease is as with many diseases it's possible for someone to be an asymptomatic, i.e. not showing any symptoms, carrier of the disease, and then pass it to other people unknowingly. This may sound familiar. It happened quite a lot with COVID. The most notorious carrier of typhoid fever, but by no means the most destructive, was Mary Mallon, who also became the first known example of an asymptomatic carrier of an infectious disease in the US. You may have heard of her by the name she hated, Typhoid Mary. Interestingly, in 1924, a farm worker in Oregon was also found to be an asymptomatic carrier with a lot of typhoid pathogens in his urine. And he passed this on to people through his job of milking cows. Typhoid fever cannot be passed through milk, um, unlike other illnesses like TB. So unfortunately, throughout this whole story, you're going to realise that anyone who is passing this on is passing it on because they are going to the loo and not washing their hands sufficiently and this milk worker was going for a pee not washing his hands milking the cow and some of his urine was going into the milk which was then going to infect people he led to the infection of at least 26 people leading to five deaths but note we don't hear about him It's typhoid Mary that we associate with being the deliverer of death to many. And typhoid fever, as with a lot of serious illnesses, understandably caused panic and distrust amongst communities. Those thought to be infected were sometimes run out of town, forced to live in isolation. And it was just this really awful illness that was doing the rounds. British bacteriologist, that's quite hard to say, Almroth Edward Wright first developed an effective typhoid vaccine in the Army Medical School in Netley in Hampshire. During the Second Boer War that I spoke about earlier, many soldiers died from the easily preventable diseases, including typhoid. And so Wright convinced the British Army that 10 million vaccine doses should be produced for the troops being sent to the Western Front, thereby saving up to half a million lives during World War I. The British army was the only combatant at the outbreak of the war to have its troops fully immunised against the typhoid bacteria and for the first time their casualties due to combat exceeded those from disease. Weak cheer. Well done everyone. I mean, (sighs) 
Today's story starts in Ireland in the 1860s. The Great Irish Famine of 1845 to 1851 was a massive disaster. The inadequate nature of the British government's initiatives led to a problem becoming a catastrophe. About one million people died, three million were left destitute, another million emigrated. At the time, Irish men and women led fairly segregated lives. Marriage was a bad economic move uh, during the time of famine. It was hard enough to feed yourself. If you got married, you would have to feed your wife and you would have children and you would have to feed them. Women were having to get to work in the fields, selling crops at markets. As Anthony Bourdain says in his amazing book on Typhoid Mary, for Irish women at the time, quote, marriage was about as much fun as a lingering illness. Immigration was not uncommon in Ireland before the famine. Between 1815 and 1845, Ireland had already established itself as the major supplier of overseas labour to Great Britain and North America. However, Emigration reached its peak during the famine, particularly in the years 1846 to 1855. Irish women went to New York not to meet a man or to break traditional Irish gender ideals, but to work and to save money and to have a chance at life. These women were alone, resourceful and tough. They didn't take any shit. The boat from Ireland to New York on your own with no money was a horrible experience on its own. Irish women in New York not uh not sort of submitting to the the expectations of of women of their class, which is fantastic. On the 23rd of September 1869, Mary Mallon was born in Cookstown, County Tyrone, in what is now Northern Ireland. We don't know a lot about her childhood or in fact her life. She didn't write accounts. She was a tough Irish cook who worked hard and lived a difficult life. She's not a lady of letters and diaries, although she could write, she could read. She was very eloquent when she did write, but uh, she wasn't uh, a journaler, shall we say. As Anthony Bourdain says, to understand Mary Mallon, you need to understand her profession, a cook in the early 1900s. Cooks were and still are a breed of their own. They're hardworking. They work in weird conditions, hot kitchens, rush time, perfection you're in this sort of you it's a separate world anyone who's worked in a kitchen understands that and they work all the time even when they're ill because either the food won't get made or someone will be brought in who can replace you maybe permanently so going to work when you feel ill wasn't wasn't a big deal as a cook and it was at the time in if you're going to work in the service industry, a cook is very well paid. Well, not very well paid, but is the top of the tree in terms of pay. We do know that Mary must have been good at her job. As from what we can tell, she was in constant employment. And not only that, but she's in constant employment in well-to-do houses during a boom in exotic cuisine. French food was in. Italian food was in. Uh, the fashion for women was to be plump and well-fed. Eating was a sign of wealth and having a good cook at home was a way to show off and to entertain people and so the fact that Mary's in these homes cooking it means that she is good at what she does the first we know of Mary Mallon is when on the 27th of August 1906 the youngest daughter of Charles Warren president of Lincoln Bank becomes ill with what would later be diagnosed as typhoid fever Before long, the girl's mother and sister were also ill. Two maids and the gardener followed suit. At the time, the family were on holiday in Oyster Bay, Long Island, in a well-appointed house owned by George Thompson. Thompson was concerned about the outbreak. He needed the rental income from his house. He owned four properties. He lived in one and rented out the other three. He couldn't afford this house if it wasn't being rented out. And he didn't want it to be associated with typhoid fever. So he he knew that he needed to uh, get this checked out. They knew that typhoid fever was transmitted through unclean water and uh, therefore usually associated with poorer living conditions. So obviously, if your house has got typhoid fever in the water system, you're not going to rent it out to your 
well well paid New Yorkers. So he has the water. There's an indoor bathroom, one indoor bathroom. He has the indoor bathroom, the water, cesspool, manure pit, and outhouse tested. And there is no evidence of typhoid found. Because of this, they send in a sanitation engineer and in comes George Albert Soper II. Sometimes I see him uh, labelled Dr. Soper, but I don't believe he is a doctor. I'm going to put that out there. I don't think he's a doctor. As it would turn out, he's not only a sanitation engineer, he's a wannabe Hercule Poirot. He's thorough in his work and his recounting of this whole story is patchy self-serving and in some places downright fictitious he puts himself at the center of this story but it is the story that makes his life and therefore we have a lot of his writing on it but it's to be taken with a pinch of salt so he arrives at Oyster Bay and he starts investigating initially rechecking all the water sources it was most likely that the illness was coming from the water and so human error was assumed but everything was fine so next he checks out a local woman who sold allegedly polluted shellfish but this was also ruled out it's worth noting that regular bathing was only just becoming a thing Uh, people uh, were suspicious of water they knew that these diseases were transmitted through water why would you dunk yourself in it more than you needed to? So people were suspicious of water as it was. Soper knew that typhoid could be transmitted through urine and began testing the urine of everyone in the house to rule it out. And he also knew that it could take 10 days to incubate. So he checked back with anyone who had visited the house. But when it was time, to test the cook who had been present at the time of the outbreak Soper was told that she left soon after the illness struck the house she'd arrived at the house on the 4th of August and left three weeks after the first person was taken ill when speaking to the members of the household he found that the cook had kept herself to herself and was noted for not being particularly clean her name was Mary Mallon Though it was suspicious that she had left, it was unclear how she could have transmitted the disease to anyone. She was not ill herself and clean or not, the fact that the food prepared in the kitchen would have involved high temperatures that would have killed off the bacteria. Cleanliness in the kitchen was known to be important, even if bathing wasn't. And hot water was kept constantly on hand to scrub pots and clean up and there would be ammonia and other chemicals in the kitchen so although she wasn't particularly clean herself she would have had she would have done some washing up she would have scrubbed she would have had ammonia around she would have had her hands exposed to these things um but it's believed that her hand washing after going to the loo left a lot to be desired as was probably the case for most people at the time Sopa then discovered that sometimes on a Sunday, Mary would prepare a pudding that was a favourite. Because this was another thing. It, the, it was difficult to understand how, if it wasn't in the water, there were members of the family and servants and the gardener being affected because they didn't all eat together, but they would all have used the water. So it unless someone had come to the house who was ill, which Sopa ruled out. But he worked out that Mary prepared this pudding that was a favourite of everyone who tried it. It was peach ice cream. Not cooked, obviously. Perfect for lovely germs to sit about in it. And it's absolutely possible that because this was so delicious that the gardener will have come in and had a bit and you know made perfect sense that this was what people wanted dr robert koch in germany had recently discovered a typhoid carrier in a strasbourg bakery and soper wondered if mary mallon was also a carrier 
So he turns detective, he speaks to the agency that had represented Mary and got some information about her previous employment. It's a patchy history, but he managed to go back quite far. Mary moved about a lot, he discovered, but eventually he found a linked series of seven household epidemics, all unexpected, unexplained and in affluent homes. The earliest was on the 4th of September 1900 when Mary was working at a house in Mamaronek where a wealthy New York family had taken a house for the summer. A male visitor to the house came down with typhoid 10 days into his visit and this was initially linked to a nearby army camp where disease was rife but this was ruled out and no one was sure how he'd been infected. In 1901, the laundress from a house where Mary was working was taken to the hospital with typhoid fever. Again, they couldn't trace where she had caught it from. In 1902, a New York City lawyer, Coleman Drayton, took Mary to a house in Dark Harbor, Maine. And two weeks after her arrival in June, the first person in the household got ill. Then the next, and soon seven out of the nine members of the household were ill. The only two people not ill were Drayton himself, who had previously had typhoid fever, and the cook, Mary Mellon. As the footman was the first to get ill, it was thought that he had been out and he had brought it into the house. And Drayton and Mary worked alone to nurse all the ill members of the household, and he was so grateful to her and thankful, and he gave her a £50 bonus on top of her salary to say thank you when it was all over. In 1904, there was an outbreak of typhoid fever in the home of Mr. Henry Gilsey at Sands Point, Long Island, where 11 people, four family members and seven servants became ill. The first was the laundress becoming ill eight days after the arrival of the new cook, Mary Mallon. The water was checked and it was thought that the laundress had brought it into the house again, that this was investigated and no link could be found. So they may think, right, well, the laundress has been in contact with someone with typhoid fever and they knew that the incubation period was up to 10 days, although actually it is longer now than they know. But So they could trace everyone that she'd been in contact with. Now, it's worth remembering that people, women in service at this time, didn't have, it. Wasn't, they weren't out necessarily hijinxing all the time. They didn't earn that much money. They were, they had limited time off. So it would be quite easy to find track down who they'd spent time with and therefore work out what was going on on leaving the house in oyster bay mary had moved to tuxedo orange county where 14 days later the laundress at the house was taken to hospital with typhoid as with the other houses the cook left her position soon after the outbreak of illness and moved from orange county to park avenue and it's here that soper tracks her down and where mary mellon's life would change forever the laundress of the house in Park Avenue had just been taken into hospital with typhoid and the family's only child, a daughter, was upstairs dying of it. Into this and into her kitchen, Soper walks. And though he says, quote, I was diplomatic as possible, it seems quite like, he seems quite like an odious man. So I'd imagine that it wasn't that diplomatic. When he told her he quote suspected her of making people sick and wanted specimens of her urine feces and blood mary chased him out of the house with a carving fork soper couldn't see the problem he thought this was a reasonable thing to have done he had offered her free medical care so that he could poke and prod her and take samples and didn't think it was too outrageous that he'd strolled into her place of work her cook's domain her kitchen in front of the people that she worked with and made these accusations. Soper himself says he didn't actually have to get her samples. His research was enough that he could prove that it was her. But he didn't think, right, I'm going to take this research to the proper authorities. No, he went straight to Mary. And when she chases him out with a, with a fork, he decides to basically stalk her. He follows her home one day, sees where she lives and sees that she cohabits with a man she's not married to. This is obviously going to uh, form other opinions about her. And this man, we'll call him Mr. B. Uh, Mr. B doesn't have a job. He's supported by Mary and he spends his time drinking in a bar around the corner from their rooms. And Soper 
then goes to this bar, buys him drinks, and over the course of a couple of days, befriends Mr. B, eventually persuading him or paying him to allow Soper to hang out in Mary's rooms until she got home from work one day. So now he's in her house. There he lurked until she got home. He then recites some speeches he'd committed to memory at her. She was understandably furious, telling him she'd never been ill or had any of the symptoms of typhoid fever. She's understandably distressed that he's in her house. Though for many, it must have been obvious to Mary that something was going on. She nursed people with typhoid fever and not got it. Uh, she'd be, it had followed her around. She must have felt it. It's important to note that at the time she had never had typhoid fever. There was no understanding that people could be an asymptomatic carrier. It's actually believed that her mother had had typhoid fever whilst pregnant with Mary, and that is how she had the bacteria in her system. And imagine someone turning up at your work and then at your home telling you that you'd cause the illness and death of loads of people, an illness that you'd never had. You know, it, if someone came to me and said, you've caused smallpox, I'd just be like, well, I've never had it. How, like, it just, it must have seemed completely bizarre. And he is spouting off these rehearsed, memorised speeches. So I can imagine he's very dictatorial. I'm no, I'm, I'm very much not pro-spreading of disease, but it sounds to me an awful lot like he wasn't going there for a conversation or a discussion but he's going there to sort of force her to submit to whatever he wanted. Finally, Sopa took the matter to the New York City Health Department where he realised that if Mary left her job at Park Avenue, which she had to, he would have a hard time tracking her down again and more people could be endangered. So he called Mary to when he was speaking to the New York City Health Department, quote, a living culture tube and chronic typhoid germ producer. He seems like such a thoughtless a-hole, even if he is right, but which he is. You don't want to be spreading typhoid around willy-nilly. The Department of Health agreed that specimens needed to be taken, and they told Soper that they would do it peace peacefully. Mary Mallon had other ideas, though. Enter Dr. Josephine Baker, not the Josephine Baker, but different Josephine Baker, and she's just at the start of her incredible work in the field of medicine she would go on to make a huge name for herself in terms of uh, women's health and she's sent to get specimens from mary and she's sent away with, with the door slammed in her face she returns with the police and an ambulance the next day and there a policeman stations themselves at each door to prevent mary making a run for it one knocks on the door and when mary opens the door and sees it's the doctor again she attempts to slam it the policeman puts his foot in the door and they chase her into the house where she manages to disappear the police question the other servants who say they haven't seen her they all clam up and a full scale search was made for three hours they looked for her and it wasn't until someone was looking out of a window and saw a bit of fabric sticking out from next door's outhouse door that they went to look there. Ash cans had been piled up in front of the door, implicating that someone had helped her. And inside they found Mary Mellon hiding. And she wasn't ready to go easily. She fought and kicked and cursed and refused to do the sample, saying that policemen would have to have her put in an ambulance and taken away, which they did. It took five policemen and Dr. Baker to subdue her. Baker would later say, I sat on her all the way to the hospital. Once at the hospital, samples were taken and the faecal sample was shown to contain large amounts of the typhoid bacteria. Now, previously, it was suspected that it could only be passed through urine. So this was um, a thing in itself. Mary's kept in this cell-like room. And from then on, samples were taken and tested three times a week between March and November 1907. And only a few times 
were no typhoid bacteria found. Mary's understandably angry. She's very healthy, very fit. Um, and she's held against her will in a confined hospital room. All white floors, walls, ceilings. She's in a bathrobe. She's having samples taken all the time. She is healthy in herself. Soper goes to visit, gives her another lecture and tells her with no medical backing that, quote, the germs are probably growing in your gallbladder. The best way is to just get rid uh, to get rid of them is to get rid of the gallbladder, which she refuses to do. Gallbladder removal, you know, in the ninety in nineteen oh seven, you don't want to have an operation voluntarily. I mean, you don't want to have one involuntarily, but it's not a case of oh, just a nip in, a keyhole surgery, whip out the gallbladder. It's a huge undertaking. Now. I'd feel a lot less sympathy for Mary if Soper wasn't part of the story. He's so annoying. He offers to write a book about her. He says, I don't know what your problem is. Why don't I write a book about you? You'll be famous. You'll be like my, my medical guinea pig and make my name for me and blah, blah, blah. Ugh. When he's finished lecturing her, she gets up, pulls her bathrobe around her and goes into the bathroom and locks herself in. And she stays there until he leaves. She's just horrified by him north brother island in new york city's east river was uninhabited until a lighthouse was built on it in 1869 and in the mid 1880s the riverside hospital moved there from blackwell's island now known as roosevelt island riverside hospital had originally been set up to treat and isolate smallpox patients and the move to north brother island was and partially to expand and include other infectious diseases such as typhoid fever. And it was to Riverside Hospital that Mary was sent. No legal proceedings, no order. She, they just decided that that was the best place for her. She was installed in a bungalow that had originally been built for the superintendent of nurses. It had a bathroom, bedroom, living room and kitchen. Mary was bought her food, which she cooked herself. And her main companion was a fox terrier, which is great companion as far as I'm concerned. And she stayed here for two years years until she managed to get legal legal representation and she didn't get just any old lawyer she got george francis o'neill who had twice stood for the republican senate we don't know how she managed to pay for him get him in contact even but many believe that the newspaper magnate william randolph hearst paid for her legal fees having read about her story in the newspaper They went to court claiming that Mary had been unlawfully imprisoned and Mary testified that she'd never had typhoid fever nor given it to anyone else. She'd never had any of the symptoms, but the opposition declared that she was a menace to society and that she'd been linked to numerous outbreaks and discovered to carry the bacteria. It was also pointed out that she was responsible for 26 known cases and had been incredibly difficult to apprehend. The court threw the case out. They didn't want to be responsible for releasing Mary into the public. And it was noted that during her time on the island, many attempts had been made to cure her, but nothing had seemed to make any difference. I mean, it's hard to cure someone when they haven't got any symptoms and they obviously, um, they didn't have antibiotics at the time. So I don't know what they were trying to do to kill the bacteria in her system. So she becomes quite media savvy. She gives interviews. She finds her own lab that that will test her samples. So she sends samples to her own doctors via Mr. B. Loyal Mr. B is still around. And they allegedly find no trace of bacteria in her samples, though we have no record of this and this didn't stand up in court so whether they were saying what she wanted to hear or it was found to be a dodgy uh practice i don't know but at the time typhoid mary as she was called sold papers and it was a way for her to get her version of events out into the public domain and she becomes famous In 1910, a new health commissioner at the New York Department of Health ordered Mary's release, saying, quote, she had been shut up long enough to learn the precautions she ought to take. 
The agreement was that she was to keep away from preparing food for others and check in with them every three months. By this time, 50 carriers had been identified in New York State, none of whom had been incarcerated or confined, though we don't know what jobs they did, but they, they could see that they have 50 other carriers. Why are they just insisting on incarcerating uh, Mary? Now, Mary's not only known to the public through the media that had given her the name Typhoid Mary, which she despised, but she's also known to the agencies that had previously given her work. She wasn't, she hadn't just been cooking anywhere. She'd been an agency cook and for these well-to-do families and they all knew who she was. So she wouldn't have been able to get work from them anyway, but it was difficult. She, it was all she knew how to do. She now had to find work as a laundress for much less money in grim conditions. And she was sort of given no help. She had, she was set free. Everyone knew who she was. Everyone was scared of typhoid fever. Um, and she had to find her own way. This grim existence was not enough for Mary, which is understandable, but here's where I begin to lose sympathy with Mary Mellon. Her life has been turned upside down. She's been prodded, poked and humiliated and possibly worst of all, had to endure George Soper banging on at her and trying to get her to remove her gallbladder. But at some point, Mary, either using the name Bresshoff, which is Mr. B's surname, or Brown, starts to cook again and stops checking in with the health department. Sometimes she's cooking in hotels, sometimes restaurants, and perhaps worst of all, in hospitals and sanatoriums. She lives with Mr. B again, but quite soon after she's released, he becomes ill and Mary gets him to the hospital, but he dies of heart failure soon after. So she's then, she's all alone. Though we aren't sure of the places she worked, because she's now very much under the radar and using different names. We do know that there were outbreaks of typhoid and that Mary never stayed around for long. Not only is it distressing that she's cooking when she knows she shouldn't be and presumably cooking her peach ice cream or similar, she's obviously not washing her hands properly after going to the loo. Which, if you look at... We all know about washing your hands properly after the COVID uh, problem. Um, and it's sort of, if you, if you eat in restaurants, I mean, if you watched anyone washing their hands who prepared food, I don't think anyone does it to standard, even if they do it really well. So at this time, the mind boggles. Um, now, of course, there, there's not the hand washing facilities that we are used to now, but she's painfully aware of how she's uh, transmitting the bacteria there have been stool samples from her sent all over new york uh, discussed in the media discussed in court if i were in her position my hands would be red raw with scrubbing not so mary and i think she's pissed off at the world she wants to just live make money so that she can live out of complete poverty and she's pissed off this went on for five years until mary was tracked down at the sloan hospital for women a maternity hospital where she is working as a cook an outbreak of typhoid occurred taking down over 20 members of staff and five others two of whom died i don't think any patients and babies were affected some servants had even taken to jokingly calling her Typhoid Mary. She's there as Mary Brown. And they are jokingly calling her Typhoid Mary because everyone's getting ill. She's fine. All staff members have to give samples. And it's Cook Mary who is found to carry the typhoid bacteria at the time. Now, by the time they discover it, she's already fled. But no, she didn't get out of giving a sample. Side note, imagine having to do stool samples at work. Does it make the prospect of going back to your job in January a bit better? No one's going to demand a stool sample from you. 
The health department's notified, Mary's identified and tracked down by the police. Once again, she's taken to North Brother Island, the Riverside Hospital. It had been nearly six years since she'd last been there and Mary had gained weight and the stress of her notoriety, homelessness and poverty had taken its toll on her mental health. There's no fight in her when she's taken in this time. She just goes. And the prospect of having a roof over her head, work in hospital eventually, regular meals and some kindness must have been appealing. O'Neill was dead and her actions are indefensible, and she just submits to being taken to Riverside Hospital. She's given a a job in a laboratory carrying out routine tests that they do there. She made friends with a few members of staff, one nurse who she would take lots of walks with and would eventually be the beneficiary of her will. Um, She was eventually allowed to take trips off the island to Queens from 1918 onwards, day trips, though we're unsure where she went, but she would take a day and go off which must have been lovely. In December 1932, she was found in her filthy bungalow having had a stroke. The doctor who found her was unable to get to her body through the piles of stuff she'd hoarded. He said the smell was awful and, yeah, he could see her on the floor collapse but needed to go and get help to get to her. She survived but she was bedridden for the next six years. On the 11th of November, 1938, Mary Mallon dies, leaving 4,000 US dollars to her friend, a nurse on the island. She also paid for her own gravestone at St. Raymond's Cemetery in the Bronx. Overall, it's thought she was responsible for infecting between 51 and 122 people with three confirmed deaths, though some estimate it could be up to 50. She was the first person in the US to be identified as an asymptomatic carrier of the typhoid bacteria and spent a total of nearly 30 years of her life in quarantine. It's believed that Mary was born a carrier of the the bacteria after her mother suffered with the illness during her pregnancy, which would explain why she maintained, I have never had typhoid in my life. And that is the story of Mary Mallon. Typhoid Mary. I hope you enjoyed this episode. A little bit of something to ease you in. I was talking to my mother and Joe about this and they were like, oh, no, we don't know that much about Typhoid Mary. And I thought, right, let's 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 ease into 2024 without serial killers, without horrible stuff happening. I mean, it's pretty horrible for her, but, you know, for this podcast, it's quite gentle. I hope you have had a wonderful festive break, whether you celebrate Christmas or not. You can email me the Monday Night Review at gmail.com. You can find me on social media at the Monday Night Review. You can check out all the extra episodes on our Patreon, which you can do a free five day trial for. If you go over there and have a look, you can listen to it for free for five days. And you can check out our merch in the links below. My husband's wearing his lovely soft Monday Night Review t shirt today, which I absolutely love. And until next time, be kind, stay safe. And always check the back seat before you drive. Hello, I'm Corinna Harrod and this is the Monday Night Review.